It's a great honor to be on the stage with you, and uh, I'd like to thank uh, Terry for this uh, wonderful event, and again, for the great honor yesterday. And the first rule of a classroom also is, since students don't sit in the front row, I get to call on people uh, in the back row, uh, which means uh, be ready with questions and discussion. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, the global dynamics of the climate change debate and the relevance for India. Uh, I think India has been a, uh, an ambivalent global player on uh, the issue of climate change. On the one side, recognizing uh, that it's important to do something about it. On the other hand, uh, not being uh, really in the leadership of action to this point. I think that this is a mistake. Uh, this country absolutely depends on a global solution to climate change. It's one of the most vulnerable places in the planet to the climate changes that are underway, and it has huge stakes in the success of the global venture. I want to put those propositions uh, succinctly uh, and then uh, explain as clearly as I can in a short period of time what I think should be done. Well, uh, we are in the midst of dramatic environmental changes, as you know. Uh, 2019 was the second warmest year on record. The last five years, 2015 to 2019, are the five warmest years in instrument record. Temperatures are rising between 0.2 and 0.4 degrees C per decade. Now, we have already warmed the planet by 1.2 degrees Celsius. And mind you, the Paris Agreement calls for limiting the rise of temperature to well below 2 degrees and aiming for 1.5 degrees as the upper limit. And we're almost there. The temperatures today on our planet are higher than at any time during the entire history of civilization. As far as the climate scientists can tell us, there has never been a decade in the last 10,000 years as warm as we are today. Now, this is almost certainly the case looking at century averages over the last 10,000 years. It's dramatic what is happening. Uh, this is a graph showing the last 10,000 years of temperature. And the red line at the end is the spike of temperatures in the last 100 years. And you can see that we've now reached a <coughs> temperature higher than during the entire Holocene. That is the 10,000 years since the end of the last ice age, the whole period of civilization. 2019, as in all recent years, was another year of mega climate disasters all over the planet. Forest fires, massive typhoons, massive floods all over the world. India was hit by every possible shock. And the extreme nature of this crisis is absolutely lived in India's reality now, year to year. Temperatures reached 50 degrees C in Rajasthan. This will become a commonplace in the years ahead. The heat wave in India was the worst in modern history. The flooding was massive. The water crisis intense. Droughts and floods beset this country in 2019 at a massive scale. I would say there is no place in the world more vulnerable to climate change than India at a large scale. Given the fact that this is a country of 1.4 billion people, soon 1.7 billion people, that is tropical or subtropical with massive hydrologic challenges, massive areas of populations uh, vulnerable to flooding, vulnerable to drought, and certainly vulnerable to extreme
temperatures which are becoming commonplace in this country. There are other places in the world extraordinarily vulnerable, to be sure. There are small island economies that will disappear. But no place at the scale of India faces this vulnerability. This is true even of Africa, which is more sparsely populated. The density of population combined with the vulnerability to climate-related disasters in this country is unique. If I were you, I would be screaming at the top of my lungs for global action. That is not happening. What's happening instead is the government saying, well, it's important, but don't push on us. It's not really our thing, and so on. This is not an appropriate kind of response to this emergency for this country. This country has every right to make demands on the rest of the world, but they should be clear, forthright, and in the context of strong action by this country. The evidence is we are accelerating in warming. My colleague, James Hansen, who I regard as the world's greatest climate scientist, has noted that if you strip out the interannual variations of the El Nino cycle, we have recently seen an acceleration of warming above the 0.2 degrees C per decade that we've experienced in the last three decades. And that arguably we are even above 0.3 degrees C per decade warming at this stage. So there was reason for alarm already in recent years. There's reason for even greater alarm with the new evidence. As Professor Hansen <coughs> and a growing uh, chorus of paleoclimatologists are noting, we've already reached CO2 concentrations that are consistent with a multimeter rise of sea levels, not the one meter that the IPCC talks about, which will be dramatic enough because it will lead to chronic flooding of hundreds of millions of habitations by mid-century on a regular basis. But multimeter, when Earth was this warm most recently, which was 115,000 years ago in the previous interglacial period, the sea level was eight meters higher than today. Think of that. The world economy not by coincidence and the world's largest cities not by coincidence are built on the coastlines of the world. I live on a small island economy called Manhattan and New York is not alone. It is actually the rule, not the exception, of the major cities being built on the coasts. What we've seen of the destruction of Venice this year will become the destruction of major cities all over the world on the course that we are on. We're also seeing other greenhouse gases rising, not only the carbon dioxide from fossil fuels, which is the main source of our warming, but we're seeing methane rise as well. It's not even understood why. It may be a feedback effect a natural feedback effect from the warming that is already underway. Now, what does this mean in terms of public policy? If we are able in the end to prove Aristotle's hypothesis that we are a rational species, we've not yet proved that. But if we are able to prove it, what does it call on us to do? Well, you said some nice words about uh, my work in sustainable development. The fact of the matter is this is more than 40 years now of attempting to get the world, not by me, by uh, tremendous numbers of thoughtful and brilliant people trying to get the world steered towards sanity towards self 
survival. And we haven't succeeded. I'm just a follower in this. The scientists have pointed this out now for decades that we're on a course of self-destruction. And they're right. And we've known the basic facts of global warming for more than a century. And then event after event has confirmed these realities. The first conference globally on sustainable development, though the term was not yet in circulation, was 1972 in Stockholm, when it was recognized that economic growth and the environment were on a collision course nearly 50 years ago. <coughs> in 1992, 28 years ago, we had the Rio Earth Summit and the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change was adopted. What came out of that? Nothing in practice. We have continued our same ways, our dependence on fossil fuels and other greenhouse gases almost unabated since 1992. In Paris in 2015, the world agreed to try to implement the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. 21 years of meetings after the first meeting when that treaty went into force in 1995. And what did the Paris Climate Agreement say? It said as the basic point of that agreement that we must keep warming well below 2 degrees Celsius and aim to keep it below 1.5 degrees C. Then the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change explained in a comprehensive report that there's a, also a world of difference between 1.5 degrees and 2 degrees warming because even 2 degrees is likely to trigger massive positive feedbacks and threshold effects that could be devastating as well as the obvious fact that the damages from droughts, floods, extreme storms, emerging diseases are highly nonlinear in their response to rises of temperatures. So the IPCC screamed again, stay below 1.5 degrees C. And it explained clearly what needs to be done to do that. And that is what's shown in this graph. We need to reduce CO2 emissions to net zero by 2050 at the latest. This is the basic bottom line to remember. We must decarbonize the world economy by 2050. That is a mere 30 years for massive global change. We are likely to fail in this, of course. And when we fail, we are likely to see dire and dramatic consequences, of course. But we need not fail because it's feasible to achieve this goal. It's just extraordinarily difficult to bring about the global cooperation for success. <coughs> the fact of the matter is what this graph shows is the reduction to zero of what's needed in emissions. And what this graph shows is the actual trend in emissions up until now upward to this moment. We have been talking about this issue intensively for 28 years since the Rio summit. We've achieved nothing, ladies and gentlemen, in changing the curve. Don't have any illusion. The curve is rising. The emissions are rising. The idea of progress is a lie because it is not happening yet. Now, why isn't it happening? Mainly because a few countries that have most of the fossil fuels don't act. Or because they do act with a massive expansion of fossil fuel use. Of course, the major increase of emissions in the last 25 years has come from China. 
with its booming coal-based economy. And China became the number one emitter in the world, about 28% of CO2 emissions. The United States about half of that. Though because China is four times the population of the United States, the per capita emissions in the US are twice China's, total emissions half of China's. But the US and China alone account for more than 40% of the world's emissions. India has much, much lower emissions per capita, but they're rising because India is also a coal-based economy. And it remains committed to coal to this day. And so we've not turned the curve. It's worthwhile understanding the basic political economy of this. Let me just say that the most important factor in a country or region's policy is how much fossil fuel it has on its territory. Not what its options are, not what uh, could actually uh, uh, be done, but whether or not it has fossil fuels and how much. So the European Union is blessed with few fossil fuels. Thank God. It's one of the few regions that basically doesn't have fossil fuels, partly because it used them up in the first Industrial Revolution. And second, it is lucky not to have too much oil. Oil is just a curse. It drives leaders crazy. My country is evidence number one. So the European Union has low fossil fuel production per capita. It's an importer of fossil fuels. It has moderate renewable energy potential. It is highly vulnerable to climate change, and it is the only region of the world truly committed to decarbonization right now. And the European Green Deal announced by the European Council last month is the most important single political breakthrough on the global scene now. India is a relatively low fossil fuel producing country. You have coal, but you also have a lot of people, so the denominator is very large relative to the coal. You're a net fuel importer. You have moderate renewable energy potential, enough. This country is extremely vulnerable to climate change, I would say the most in the world. And yet the national politics are divided about what to do. China has moderate per capita fossil fuel production, a lot more coal per capita than India. It's also a net importer of fossil fuels, of oil and gas. It's got moderate renewable energy potential. It has high, not extreme, vulnerability to climate change. And it's also divided politically on what to do. Then there are the countries of high fossil fuel production, Russia, the Gulf countries, the United States, Canada, and Australia. Every one of them is a status quo country politically. They're not changing. They may talk about change, but they're not changing. Russia wants to export its gas. The Gulf wants to export its oil and gas. The United States would like to export every fossil fuel. If Trump had his way, he'd blow up the planet by himself in terms of climate. Truly sociopathic. Canada and Australia are also bad behaviors because they want to maximize their fossil fuel exports as well. It's amazing, the case of Australia. This is a near desert country with a thin sliver of uh, habitability with great ecosystem vulnerability, mega forest fires, destruction of the Great Barrier Reef, massive flooding, massive droughts, massive heat waves, and yet it doesn't act. Why? 
because of coal, because of political corruption, because of Rupert Murdoch, because when you have these fossil fuels, they poison the mind. They make it so blind to our own survival that you have a country that is aflame, and yet it can't get its act together to utter an honest sentence. Shame on Morrison. But he is simply symptomatic of how this works. I see it in my own country, and I'll explain that a little bit more in a moment. So Europe is the only place right now of a major country actually on the right track. I credit European leaders for this, but I mostly credit the absence of fossil fuels in Europe for this. Because that the is the thing that has clarified the mind. We actually need a series of regional green deals. North America, South America, <coughs> EU, CIS, the Arab region, South Asia, ASEAN, Northeast Asia, and the African Union. This is the only thing that can save this planet, is regional cooperation around rapid decarbonization. Any region torn asunder like this one is by politics will fail. Your success will depend on cooperation with Pakistan and with the neighbors, because that's how renewable energy works. That's how ecosystems work. A region that is in the midst of, oh my god, the threats of war, the language of war, will never focus to save itself. We need regional agreements. Why regional? At least three reasons. First, renewable energy is geographically concentrated and therefore needs to be shared across borders. It's intermittent, so we need grids that extend across national boundaries. And third, regions, that means transnational regions, share critical biomes, riversheds, fisheries, and other absolutely vital ecological realities. You must cooperate with neighbors, or else ecosystems will be destroyed. Well, I gave a little example. I won't dwell on it, but the idea is imagine two regions, each of which has wind power half the time completely anti-correlated. It's windy one place, still the other place. If each one tries to make renewable energy decarbonization on its own, you need storage for half your energy use. If you simply have a connected grid, you don't even need storage because you have the same size production, but you share in the off, uh, in, in, in the moments when you are not producing you're drawing the power from your neighbor. And so geographically dispersed renewable energy is vital for success and efficiency. Cooperate with your neighbors. What are the technological pathways to success very quickly? We need zero carbon electricity. This is the core of everything. Power should be generated with zero carbon. Then electrify everything possible, buildings, transport, and industry. Make a smart grid. Produce synthetic fuels out of renewable energy. Strong energy efficiency, like A.J. Matur has led in this country brilliantly, because that solves problems if you have energy efficiency. Manage land use sustainably and have justice in the transition. Just to say there are easier sectors and harder sectors to solve. About 75%, and Lord Adair Turner has done great work on this, uh, are relatively straightforward to solve. About 25% require more complex solutions. One of the solutions is synthetic fuels made by renewable energy. I don't have time to go 
uh, into it, but we can make synthetic liquids, we can make synthetic methane, we can make and we can also make hydrogen out of renewable energy or out of coal with carbon capture and storage that then are clean burning fuels. So there are solutions. It's been shown in the academic literature now repeatedly that we could move to a 100% renewable grid by 2050. I'm sorry, to complete decarbonization by 2050. Please know that. Look it up. <coughs> I will leave references. A recent paper that I like very much shows what a world energy system completely decarbonized would look like. It would basically be a solar system with a little bit of wind in the northern latitudes. But solar power by itself irradiates the planet roughly 5,000 times our power use. Solar energy with the dramatic drop of costs of photovoltaics and battery storage mean that we can essentially run the world economy on solar plus smaller amounts of wind, ocean, hydro, geothermal, and other zero energy sources. Of course, there would be vast <coughs> benefits of this decarbonization as well. When I looked out the window this morning, well, it was a typical Delhi morning. I couldn't see anything. And when I looked at the air quality index this morning, it's the worst in the world here and in China by far. It was 239 in the neighborhood this morning in the air quality index. This is killing millions of people in this country. It's just mind boggling, mind boggling that this is not addressed as a matter of national emergency by itself, much less in tandem with renewable energy and decarbonization. This shows the places where in this particular article, solar dominates, that's the yellow, and where wind dominates, that's the high latitudes where the winds blow more strongly. The evidence is this is not even costly to make this transition. Maybe at the top 1% of world output per year between now and 2050 to avoid disaster. And this is a, <coughs> a illustration from a Chinese uh, project, Global Energy Interconnection Development Cooperation Organization, which shows rightly that having an interconnected grid through Asia is part of the solution. That requires cooperation. The United States is against cooperation because it aims to be a hegemonic power. So it is in favor of divide and conquer, the ancient imperial strategy. It's trying to fight a trade war with China. This is nearly insane, not surprising given our politics, but nuts. Cooperate, I'm telling you, do not divide. And we're one more war away from complete and utter disaster. Even if the war itself didn't do us in, which it most likely would, it would distract us to make it impossible to solve these problems. Cooperate with China. Don't listen to the garbage from the United States. It's reckless, it's dangerous, and it's the interest of the American empire, which is no real interest at all. Who wants to live in an empire? Cooperate on the Silk Road project as well. Because we need to upgrade infrastructure and make it sustainable throughout Eurasia. Well, I go on to talk about how to make policies for this uh, decarbonization, but the main way is regulatory. Stop licensing coal-fired power plants. Only allow expansion of capacity of zero carbon energy. Declare that by 2030, all new vehicles sold in this country will be electric vehicles. 
this is clear. Economists want to put carbon taxes and blah, blah, blah. It's not right. You will not get the changes needed at the pace that's needed, aside from direct regulation that says we're moving to decarbonization by 2050. So, what's really going on is the status quo countries, the United States, Canada, Russia, China, India, the Gulf, Australia, Indonesia account for three quarters of the fossil fuel production in the world. China and India together, <coughs> which account for 40% of the world's population, have a phenomenal stake and will be the determinants of the future. They have no business being on the status quo list because your country and China are not fossil fuel powers. Even the employment in the coal industry in this country is at most one-tenth of one percent of the labor force of this country. This is a small matter Professor in terms Sachs. of jobs of the future. Professor Sachs. Almost nothing. Almost finished. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> Get off of the status quo and understand my country. The United States is a completely corrupt political system. Have no doubt about it. Our Senate, you watch the senators these days, they look like zombies. But they're not. They're just corrupt. Why? Because they're on the take for campaign contributions because they want their jobs so they take handouts from the oil and gas industry. The oil and gas industry is the major lobby in the United States. They are reckless, selfish, short-sighted. The Republican Party is essentially owned and operated by the oil industry. And they the ones that told Donald Trump pull out of the climate agreement He's sociopathic enough to do it, but they are corrupt enough to ask. And that's how it worked. 90% of the contributions of this industry go to the Republican Party. Let me just tell you, though, that investing in fossil fuels is a lousy, stupid business. This is an industry on the way out. So if you look at the Standard & Poor's over the last five years, it went up 11.7% per year. Coal went down 2.7% during this period. Fracking investments down 11%. This is on the US exchanges. Oil services down 16%. Investing in low carbon up 8%. But the lobbies have determined the policy. By the way, the American people are not as stupid as our politicians make us look. About 80% of Americans are on the right side of this issue now. This is corruption, not public opinion in the United States. Professor Sachs. So just to stop, here are the 10 rules that I would like to suggest to you. Stop all new coal plants, period. Every coal plant you build will either kill people with air pollution, destroy the climate, or have to be scrapped. Second, stop new oil and gas exploration because we have more than enough in the world. We're going to have to strand the oil and gas assets. Keep them underground. Stop new fracking. This is <coughs> an absurd activity. It's high cost. It loses money. It is not a stepping stone fuel. Natural gas is not a stepping stone to anything but disaster. That's just propaganda of the oil industry. Stop new oil and gas pipelines. Stop new deforestation. 
shift to battery electric vehicles by 2030, invest in hydrogen and synthetic liquids, divest from greenhouse gas emitting companies, that's a good investment, restrain the oil companies and pro-carbon governments, tell the truth to the United States government. They're acting, they're, I believe that these are crimes against humanity, pulling out of the Paris Agreement. Nothing less than that. It's a kind of psychopathy. And interconnect renewables. That means cooperate with your neighbors. Thank you very much.